Welcome to Land Academy. I'm Jack Butella. I'm Jill DeWitt. We show you how to buy real estate for half of what it's worth. And sell it on the internet really fast. We, we are, are Jack, Jack and Jill, and this, and this is, is the Jack, Jack and Jill, Jill Show, show too. too. With over 15,000 completed transactions, we're the experts at acquiring property. Of all kinds, not just land. For half price and flipping them for way more. All right, let's get this show started. Luke Smith retired from being a penny stockbroker at 33 and is now a full-time dad of two toddlers from Encinitas, California. He heard about Land Academy on BiggerPockets.com. He has not completed a purchase from his mailers yet, but he got a huge response. And uh, he's using that to learn from, and he's sending out higher targeted mailers. Boy, it sounds uh, like, Luke, that we're catching you right before massive success. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what, I mean, uh, you know, tell us, uh, you sent the mailer out. Give us a little bit of uh, some of the details and some of the types of calls that you got back and the response that you got. Sure, I'd love to. So I was too cheap to pay for your program at first. I thought I'd give it a try with all the free information. And just reading between the lines, I thought I'd give it a try. So I fired off a couple hundred mailers and people started calling. And awesome. I think where I was off base was I was going off the appraised values and doing a, like a smaller piece of the appraised values. I was thinking I should sell these properties for a couple thousand bucks or more. So I would go for a couple thousand dollars or more appraised values. And uh, the people that are calling back think their properties are worth, you know, 50 grand or 100 grand. I'm offering like $400 or <laughs> you know, right. a couple hundred dollars. And uh, but I was amazed at how many actually called back. Yeah. They read their mail. Um, they stewed on this thing. You know, they, they got pissed off at my low ball offer. They really value their land. And uh, they called me back and they they want to chew me out or. <laughs> haggle on price or you know to me that that's uh that's success like my numbers were wrong i can fix that in the next you know the next ones mm -hmm. but those are potential buyers of land those are people who buy vacant land in the middle of nowhere that i was making offers on mm -hmm. and they have astronomical numbers that they value that land at well you're exactly right they're they are you know on your buyer list now i hope yeah exactly that's great. You know. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. I, I, have, to, I have to interject one thing, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was no, going to say, yeah. when you have these people, though, um, I, 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 I feel like a broken record, but $10,000, you know, they think it's worth $10,000 um, three, six months from now, your $500 offer is not so bad, you know. Oh, it's yeah. it's they so, some they sometimes they they do overvalue. It's a priceless asset to them, and I get it. It was handed down to the family, whatever. But then they realize, gosh, nobody really does want this, and this guy's willing to give me something, you know. And then they do a little homework, and they realize, you know, you're not that far off. Yeah. So it's it it, it can happen still. So it's good. Did you uh, look the, the the offers that you sent out? Did you? Um send an offer out that was modeled after the ones that we always send out? Was it an actual offer? It was an actual offer, a two-page offer with a dollar amount in there. And I put a reply envelope and, you know, I was amazed at how many people sent back notes and comments and things on the offer in the reply envelope um, with no postage on it. And the post office still delivered it. Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, because it had my name and address in both to and from. And uh, so I wonder how many got lost in the mail. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just went off of like your free information to give it a try. And then I, you know, I believed in it so much after that I bought your program. And I believe I've gotten a lot more accurate by, you know, watching all your DVDs and going through the details from there. So we'll see how this next mailing comes through. Jill, this is another oh. podcast guest that we probably should have paid. I know. We should pay we should have paid him to be on the show. <laughs> Can't rehearse this kind of stuff. Well, I, I'm just <laughs> I'm skeptical. You, know, you have a lot of good stuff to say and so you know, I don't really want to pay for it right out of the bat. I want to test it first. It's cheaper <laughs> mm -hmm. to test it and believe in it more and then pay and that's what I did. So mm -hmm. I love it. Here. No, that's 
you did everything right. It's perfect. And that's what I love about the ebook that when we put that out initially, it was the number of emails that came back that said, "Uh oh, this works. Now what do I do? Yeah, you know? that's exactly <laughs> what I'm hearing. Was, mm-hmm. So what do you remember the raw numbers look like? How many you sent out? What kind of responses you got? The percentages? I sent out. You know, I was printing them off of my printer, which is really slow, and stuffing them myself. And so I could I could do about a hundred a day, like mm-hmm. doing the mail merge and putting it together. And I I was also testing different counties, and so I did a hundred a day, and I directed them at tax delinquent mm-hmm. people, and uh, only, and I sent out. Uh, uh, over 400 of them. It wasn't exactly 100 day, 120 or something. And I think I got more than 20 callers off of each one of those counties, some counties more. Uh, so I think it's very specific on which county I was doing mm-hmm. it to. Like one particular county, I think I probably got 30 to maybe 40 callers from the 100 mailers. <laughs> so you got up 20% return, ballpark. Yeah. I mean, that That's is fantastic. absolutely amazing. I can't believe that many people read the mail. Right. I mean, I'm I'm a internet guy. I like electronic signature and you know email and that kind of stuff. Not sending stuff through the old fashioned mailbox, but people get stuff in the mail and they read it. Yeah, it doesn't get lost in the the sea of, of junk email. No. <laughs> Well, and that, that's a, that's great. You know, I, Joe and I have not done a, a tax specific mailer in quite some time. We kind of stick to the ones where, um, you know, well, you, we stick to the ones that we talk about in our program, in our, uh, you know, education materials and our percentage, our return percentages are a little bit lower, but boy, when they, uh, Joe can convert them pretty well. So when they do come back, call back, she's, you know, we, it works pretty well, works very well. We're closer to 5%. It's, it's probably easier to scale up the you know sending a mailer to everybody instead of just the tax delinquent people Mm -hmm. you could do it on bigger size so did anybody sign the offer and just send it back no no one signed and sent it back not yet though not yet (laughs) exactly (laughs) boy that's great news so where do you want to where do you want to go with all this i'd i'd like to have the other problem i got so many properties in my hand i don't know how to sell them all uh huh. That's where I want to go right now. Um, but eventually, scaling that business up and see see how big I can scale it up to. Um, have someone else answer the phone and close the deals. You know, automate the thing eventually. Mm-hmm. Just pick which markets I should be targeting. Doing the strategic planning of this market, this size property, or this specific criteria that we want to make offers on to put the capital into right now right those kinds of decisions but boil the business down to just that um but to be able to do that i want to learn all the aspects of the business sure all the jobs myself first how far are you in the education program in our program i went through all your dvds and i looked through most all the data uh data discs looking at forms and maps and and everything excellent yeah. Cool. All right. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions like, uh, what is the worst job you've ever had? <laughs> hmm. I'm, I'm from northern Michigan. I think you guys. Oh, my gosh. It's Michigan Day. Yeah, Michigan. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. But he's in California now, everyone. We have. Uh, Yay. This is the yeah. fourth show we've done today. And every single person on the show is from Michigan. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so where in Michigan are you from? Um, I summered and vacation and everything close to Traverse City and northern Michigan, northern lower Michigan. It's a very vacation town So for people that don't know it. And one of the things that tourists do when they go there is they, they buy fudge, uh, Doug Murdoch's fudge. It's like the, the renowned fudge show, s- store. And so I got a job. It's probably my first job in one of his shops right on the side of town mm-hmm. and we used to make and sell fudge and it was it was quite the mundane job <laughs> talking to tourists all the time but because it was right on the side of town people would stop there and ask for directions probably more people ask for directions than stop there to buy fudge and uh, so we used to have fun with it 
um, <laughs> giving them all kinds of directions. Uh, I was the only guy working there. It was all good looking younger girls. And uh, they had set up these perfect, you know, like spreadsheets drawn up by hand of directions. How many lights, here, <laughs> right turns and left turns there to get to pretty much everything around the area. And so you could t- go by their directions. But who's going to do that, right? When you get asked like 100 times a day. Mm-hmm. And so the other tourist destination in northern Michigan that everyone's looking for is Mackinac Island and how far to Mackinac Island and how do you get there. And there's the Mackinac Bridge. It's a big bridge that connects lower Michigan and northern Michigan. So we would tell them, go to the bridge and wait at the base of the bridge until the bridge turns over to the island. And then you can drive across the bridge to the island and, you know, get more detailed in the story about it. But we used to do that like all day and not think anything of it. And people would never come back, you know, they can't find you again when they're lost. <laughs> but there was a story that came up in the, the newspaper about people stopping by the bridge. And uh, other people had heard this story. So some of the gas stations were telling the same story. And it became like a local joke about people that would stop at the bridge and wait for it to turn over to the island so they could get to the island. <laughs> yeah, so we used to have fun with it. But it was... A completely boring, useless job. Yeah. <laughs> the only you know, thing I really learned was how to count back change. I think, uh, you know, when you're dealing with the public, like a customer service job like that in person, that that ranks pretty high on my list of the worst jobs you can have, too. Yeah. Jill, you had a job like that, didn't you? No, it's funny because I used to work when uh, years ago at the Little Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory in Laguna Beach. <laughs> <laughs> Similar kind of job, but we didn't give them. We they they were they have arrived there. there was no really nowhere to go for directions. You know, right there at Main Beach, it was really fun. But we had a good time. It's you know, fun. my sister's uh, fr- lives in Traverse City. She's lived there since the ninety early nineties, mm-hmm. and she loves it. She wouldn't work, uh, live anywhere else. That's it's beautiful for two maybe three months a year. Yeah, the rest of the time is just Arctic. Yeah, that's why we live here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, what was your primary motivation to get involved with Land Academy? It just resonates with me the simplicity. Um, I'm a landlord of of properties, and you know, there's all kinds of problems and things over time. They pay great yields. Um, just rental properties that I have, but it's, uh, you know, I buy the things with no insurance because I don't like to deal with the insurance. Yeah. You know, just insure myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't like to use the banks. Uh, I paid cash for them all and you know, just try to cut out a lot of the middlemen as much as I can. And it just makes a much simpler business. And, uh, the land business is already set up that way. That's right. normal. That's, that's the way it's done. The bankers and the, a lot of the other middlemen don't even bother. They don't want to be involved in it. To me, that's that's great. And there's margins there. Because those people don't service and market that business, there's little competition. It's a contrarian play. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that so few uh, lenders will lend on rural vacant property? And so, you know, you're exactly right, by the way. That, and and that was one of the reasons that I chose this little niche in real estate a lot of years ago, because everybody doesn't, you know, there's so few people that get involved. And I still don't understand that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. It just, I don't think they can get over the concept of the the land and pay rent it's like wall street doesn't like gold because gold doesn't pay interest that's right or silver or other commodities they don't pay interest they don't want to be in that business they want to be in the interest collection business great analogy actually you're right wall street doesn't like precious metals no so what's been the best part of your experience so far I uh, see my phone blow up from making those offers. I think that it's spectacular. It's, uh, you know, I just have to make better offers, more targeted offers that are on properties that are more attainable for the prices I'm offering. Yeah. And, uh, you know, close that gap. 
it turned down the, the pissed off callers and up the happy callers. And I think you've got an awesome business there. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's verification of what I'm looking for, an investment, uh, investment of time and money. So that makes it worth my time and money. How many you know, people called me back? I think it's great that you didn't spend a dollar on our program or any of the other stuff that we offer and that you tested it yourself, it passed your tests, and then you said, all right, now I'm going to, I'll get serious about it, make a commitment kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's excellent. It's worth it. Well, I appreciate too, Luke, that you didn't get turned off by... It was a little, it, there's a lot of tweaking that goes on, and, you know, and you're reaching out in different counties and stuff. And um, I appreciate when these people called you back, you didn't go, all right, that's it, I'm out. I don't want to talk to people when they're unhappy. No, that's, I just got to tweak it a little bit. And oh, by the way, they're motivated or they wouldn't be calling me anyway. So there's some good there. So yeah. that's good. Well, I used, I used to be a penny stock broker for natural resource stocks, right? Like highly speculative natural resource stocks. Wow. And uh, so I had a lot of clients and I advise them on what stocks to buy. And with the idea that some of them will make you a killing and most of them probably burn and die along the way. And yeah. every now and then guys get too many of the ones that, you know, die along the way and they get pissed off because they didn't get the one that made a discovery and pays out huge. Mm-hmm. When I have lots of clients and money that I'm doing this with myself, I see the the big ones come through for some of the guys and then some of the others and then some of the others and compounding money over time. Um, you know, trying to explain that to the people that are pissed off about the ones that didn't work. It's, uh, you know, I've got a background to that. I don't know if I can say it. <laughs> You have a background of getting heated phone calls from customers. Yeah. <laughs> telling them how it's, you know, how the business and the speculation that we got into still makes sense for, from this kind of math and explain it to them and how people make money off of those odds. And it's not every single play. You know, the losers are the learning curve and the winners can be huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's great way good. to put it. Boy, I'll tell you, you're bringing the right attitude to this. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there are, um, you know, some, some members get very, very discouraged with uh, a couple of negative phone calls or, um, you know, a one or 2% return on a mailer. But, you know, if you keep plugging away, I'm sure you're going to, I'm sure you're going to, you'll do what the system is set out to, to, you know, to yield. Yeah. I can take a lower response rate because that'll probably be a, a lower number of pissed off callers because it'll be more targeted. It'll be closer to realistic. There'll be more people just putting the mail in their file and less people calling to chew me out. I mean, that's the thing to remember too. I mean, and you know, I'm sure you know this. Every single, or almost every single one of those people are putting that, they're putting that letter or that offer in the file. You're going to get calls yeah. for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some life event happens and they need money real quick. You know, how are they going to get the money? Hey, this guy offered me money for my land. He mm-hmm. said I can close quick. I'm giving him a call. Right. It makes it a liquid asset to them. And yeah. they otherwise thought it was just, uh, you know, a, a regular piece of real estate. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So once you reel in a couple of these, are you going to flip or you want to flip or do terms? Or you said you're a landlord, so you're all set up for collecting payments, I guess. Yeah. I've, you know, I was just doing accounting on that before this call, like all morning long. I mean, I do that. I can just, I got the software and the system set up. I can just add on to that pretty easily. Um, and, uh, I'd like a combination of the two. I think in, you advise that in one of your DVDs, you know, flipping some for cash and others for terms and thinking about the property a bit. Like, do you want to get this one back again and again and again if you're selling it on terms? Mm-hmm. Or do you really want this one done and gone? Mm-hmm. And also your your cash balance, you got to take into account your, your cash. I mean, you can't just put everything on terms. You run out of business. Um, or you slow down your acquisitions pretty quick as you're just collecting payments and using that to buy more. Right. Uh, so I think a balance of the two is, is the most sustainable, best path to growth. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd like to do that. The best, uh, 
the first thing that I look at when I make a, a cash versus terms decision, and, and and it's always in the back of our heads, always, is access. So if you find a good access property that, and I mean, you can take a, kind of a two wheel drive, um, you know, vehicle right up to it. Those yeah. are those are the terms properties that we keep usually. So that's about two to one, Joe. Don't you think? Maybe three to one. Three to one. Three cash, one terms. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Or some number like that. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, so that. you got the quick growth and the long-term cash flow. Right. Put mm-hmm. them together and it sounds perfect. Yeah. Or I'll just do a bunch of cash until I, I get to the point now where it's like, it's got to be something really good and I'll roll it into my terms, you know, deals and don't even think about them, you know, so... I, I wait for those awesome ones. Like, yep, we're going to keep that one. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah. yeah it kind of smacks you in your face, I think. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. man, that's, you know, you, you do the review on it. You know, you do the review on the properties that come back in the mail or on the phone mm-hmm. to see if you want to buy them. And you know right there what you're going to do with what, what, Bingo. which one's going to be. And you'll know who you're going to sell to. You know, you, you have an idea all ahead of time how it's going to go. Right. It's true. Luke, do you have any uh, advice for new investors? I guess you're sort of a new investor, but it sounds to me like you, you know, you've dipped your feet in this for for a while now, or some version of it. So, do you have any advice for super new people? <laughs> That's always the question, right? Um, I think the beauty is of this business is it's scalable. Um, so you could start with small dollars or larger dollars, depending on what kind of size you want to take on. And so I'm very against using debt and leveraging. Um, I think there's smarter ways to to speculate on this kind of business. You know, speculate with ten cents to make a dollar instead of speculating with a dollar to make ten cents. I think if you think in those kinds of logical terms, you won't borrow money to to start this kind of business. You could start small with cash that you have and make it a lot easier to take on this this kind of uh, Speculation for me, this is a speculation, right? That's great advice. I'm a huge believer in uh, zero debt. Uh, I've I've said it for years and years and years. In fact, the whole company these both these companies that we have, um, I, I closed a, a fairly large deal as a real estate broker and uh, poured some of the money into it and started. It and I never I've never had to put any money into it since debt or equity or otherwise. So I completely agree with that. I get the one of the questions that I get all the time from people. Um, from new in- investors are, should I do this deal? I'm looking at this deal. I'm staring at it. I don't know if I should do it. Steve, what do you think? And I, my answer is, if you have to ask me that or think about, if it doesn't just hit you over the head that you need to do this deal fast, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Or if uh, if you're going to borrow a ton of money to do it, I, that just scares me. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, you talk about options and or partnering up with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, those those kinds of ways of doing it instead of putting it on your credit card and making a mistake or something, you know, yep. throw it yeah. at Steve and let him pay for it. <laughs> Jill's the option queen. <laughs> she, I, I, every, every property that we get that's over five acres, she her it's just in her blood to not write a check for it. And it's in, it's kind of in my blood too. It's 500 bucks for five acres. Let's control the asset completely, spend the money. And then, uh, you know, even if it sells, it's not as fast as we think. There's a bunch of stuff we can do with it. Look, if we made a decision to buy it, if it passes our tests, it's it's we can pay the money for it. Her reaction is, eh, let's string this out and see what happens." And and it, and it almost she's she, she's almost always right about that. I'm like, let me sell it and then I'll buy it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's way more fun. <laughs> On your list of inventory, Mm -hmm. like some of the properties say owner, number, and then a number, are those properties that you've optioned? Like Mm. someone else owns it or am I misunderstanding that? That's a great question. That's Uh, a very good question. That's just the county. Some of the counties, they'll, instead of putting an APN, they'll, they they in their reference system you're an owner number so that's all it is i'll have the apn in there and the right. owner number gotcha so, yeah. good question no we don't differentiate on that um you know i'll, I'll say this that I don't think there's any option property on that list at all. That's all owned property. The option property, right. we make a decision to option a property. 
um, because we know it's going to sell so quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, we wouldn't option a property and then take 90 days to sell it. Jill, or maybe you would, would you? Option it and then sell it? No, no, no. For like 90 days and just kind of see what happens. I think that we option property so, that we know we can sell in like a week. It's right then and there. It's like, I just, it's like, you know, I, I have a letter on my desk. It's so darn sweet from, I got physically in the mail and she, from 2008 and it's a, a nice 10 acre. I'm already got on my head. I know what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to offer it to somebody else and just do the option deal. And sometimes it happens so darn fast, you know, I'm sending in, sending in two deeds to record at the same time do this one first and then this one (laughs) yeah so that's that's what i'm doing yeah i think taos county new mexico has that owner system i I would bet some money that that's what that's what's on there Mm -hmm. i think you're right mm -hmm. there's a few of them and that's just that's just i put it in there you know that's a good question luke i put it in there for potential buyers so when they want to call the county and check the taxes or i don't know ask about building situation or whatever they want to do with it they have all the resources there so the county can go on the apn doesn't work for me what's the owner number and so they can do their own due diligence gotcha a lot of years ago i was at a tax sale there this is many 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 years ago and i asked why why they have that owner system like that there's another county in new mexico that does the same thing and they said and this is you know in the early days of computers they couldn't uh, take that relational database to mail out tax uh, bills so they had an owner number so they knew that if the owner had 25 properties in it the, that they could just send one package out and pay the postage for one uh, parcel instead of 25 gotcha. that's the origination of that <laughs> It's silly now. Mm -hmm. That leads me into another question. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess about the depth of this market. Like, do you guys ever run into the same properties? You you see the same property come through your your office over time. Go ahead, Joe. No, I don't. That's a really good question. Oh goodness, no. That was one of the concerns I had when I started. You know, are we going to run out of property? Am I going to eventually send every single property owner a letter? And and it took me about it's about eight months. I probably never told you that, (laughs) Joe. No, it took me about eight months to figure out. Oh my, there's just it's just endless. And the real reason that it's endless, and I and I talk about this in in the package is. um, because of the way the tax system is, the property tax system is set up in this country, you know, every year, sometimes twice a year, they get an, a little note in the mail, the landowner does, reminding them that they have to pay on, an, on a piece of property that they don't really care about anymore. Really, really works into our, works to our advantage as investors. Mm-hmm. So no, I, I, don't, if, I hope that answers your question. No, we never yeah. see the same property coming back or mm-hmm. it just seems endless. Yeah. Good question. I lost them. I think I did. I know. Hey, Luke, are you there? Yeah, I think my connection dropped off for oh. a second, but I hear you now. Okay, okay good. Cool. Joe, Joe, you're here. Yep. Okay. I'm here. Yeah. Good so, deal. I was asking about that because I, I look at like maps of APN numbers and who the owners are in these different counties, and it's like a different person in each parcel. And it's just amazing how many people own this land. And it's not, it's not, yeah, there are some that it's the same guy owns a piece of land, but it's so extra among so many people, so many different owners. Right. Mm-hmm. That that looks like a, an opportunity kind of approach to me. Jill, what, do you still ask the question when people call and? Um, landowners call in do you ask them if they've received lots of offers from other people do you even get into that anymore i used to do it all the time just for out of curiosity more than anything you know i don't um but they do volunteer it to me um it's funny like this guy the guy called me back this morning and we we were he, we we just renegotiated. He got another fifty dollars out of me, and I said, "Sure." <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of funny. I, I even made it. I even made You're a joke. slipping. I said, "Well, you know, because I'm getting a couple <laughs> acres for six hundred dollars." Just joking. Everyone completely. So joking. seriously, and he's like, "Could could we do seven? And I said. Tell you what, I'll meet you in the middle. I'll give you six fifty. I'll still pay for everything. This is so funny. 
And I said, and this way, hey, I'm helping pay for you and your wife to go out and have a nice dinner. <laughs> Part of it. <laughs> so anyway, but no, um, but he did let me know the other day the reason he was calling me back was because he had another guy that was interested so but you know I just I really walk I've I don't know if my head has gotten too big or what but I really walk around with the assumption that I am the only one and you're going to want to sell to me I'm going to make it so easy what's left to talk about you know and it's worked great (laughs) every time I used to ask that question to a landowner they would respond like this yeah I got a letter from somebody or a postcard from somebody a couple years ago but I never got one like the one you sent where it says uh, we're going to close on Friday or whatever the date is and this is the specific amount that we're willing to pay and, and these are the steps to take. And I think that's what, what our process makes us stand out. Plus, I think, Jill, honestly, I think they remember you. Mm-hmm. You know, I think they remember the conversation with you. Mm-hmm. I think that they really do. helps. They do. Even today, I'll tell you the guy who's just, he's sending me a physical death certificate with the situation. He went back to her, he will, and I know this was a really a nice thing. He went back to her old original letter and the address hasn't changed over the years. You know, I'm like, yep, same address, same phone number, same fax. He's like, oh, I'm like, yeah. So that's very helpful yeah, too. Sure. Mm-hmm. So Luke, do you have any uh, inside track advice? Inside track advice? Yeah, it could be inside track advice for penny stocks even. <laughs> I have a bunch of questions about that actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh I have helped a lot of people through that. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's done well by me. Uh you know, somebody made a movie recently about penny stocks. <laughs> Is all that stuff true? The Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> There's there's a lot of slime balls out there in the <laughs> stock industry. <laughs> um, the firm I got in with is is quite reputable. Um, eventually got bought out by a public publicly traded brokerage house out of Canada, and uh, I mean great guys, just awesome people to learn from. The main guru there is Rick Rule and uh, Sprott, Eric Sprott. I don't know if you've ever heard of any of these these guys. It's all about um, natural resource penny stocks. Mm-hmm. And uh, the strategies that they use to buy these things are very value-oriented, the same kinds of ideas as going after land. Um, they do it on mining operations or exploration op- operations. You know, they make offers. We'll give you money at these terms. Take it or leave it. No one else has the money to give you. Right. And... Uh, you know, we'll actually give you the money. The other guys say we'll shop around and try to raise the money. We'll give you the money. We have it right here, mm-hmm. uh, ready to go. And uh, you know, it was just a much more stand-up outfit that had a lot of uh, a lot of followers because of that. I mean, they didn't really do any marketing when I started there for years and years. It's just referrals. You know, make people money and they come back and they recommend you. And that's the best marketing you can have. And uh, mm-hmm. so that's that was that was a big piece of it. Um, other inside track, I mean, that might be the best inside track. Just take care of your customers, like Jill is always saying, like you guys are always saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I that's I true. couldn't agree more. Don't that's get true. negative reviews on on eBay or Yelp or anywhere. Right. right. Take care of them. Exactly. Is there a resource Even if that, it costs more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. What's the one resource you couldn't succeed without? If there um, is one yet. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say the internet. Um, oh, that's a good one. That's basic. Ooh. It's one we overlook all so, the time. Yeah. That's a good one. That's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, I, I'm a big proponent of the internet. Freedom of information. Hey, if you had to start over, uh, all over tomorrow, knowing what you know, what would you do differently? You mean start your package or my life business or both, but both or either. (laughs) I got into some extreme debt when I was in high school. Um, like before I went to college, I was about a quarter million dollars in the hole and uh, I still had to pay for school and 
my friends were looking at getting jobs and I was saying, you know, that's not going to work. I got bigger payments than a job can come up with. Um, I've got to get more creative than that. Um, and take some better speculation, some better businesses, better deals than what I've been into. And, uh, I think if I could go back in time, I mean, I, I don't know if I would say don't take on any debt, but I sure wish I didn't take on as much as I did Uh, because it took me a while to pay for it and climb out. But I learned a lot from that on living debt free from there (laughs) and not, not doing those kinds of crazy speculations that I used to do. Mm-hmm. Take a, a smarter, smarter approaches with capital that I can uh, afford to lose, um, and then, I mean, career-wise, over time, um, the more studying and figuring I did, the less I wanted to be a slave to an employer, like a nine-to-five job where I have to commute and trade my time for money. Uh, I want to trade my intellect. For capital, mm-hmm. and if I would have started out with that mindset instead of what I was taught in school to go get a job and to show up on time and be there for these certain amount of hours, no matter how hard you work or how smart you work, you, know, mm-hmm. you, you trade that time for for some kind of paycheck, whether it's hourly or salary or whatever. I mean, that, that's enslavement. Um, if I could go back and teach myself that in the past. I would have retired a lot younger. Um, now I, you know, I spend a lot more time spear fishing with my friends out here in a lot of islands and offshore Southern California and at the beach and taking my kids to all kinds of different places, different beaches, pools, hiking events, parks. I mean, stacking the days thick with child events, right? That's that's what I love to do, and You're here. I love to have that passion at the forefront of my my time allocation instead of a job or career. I think there's a lot better ways to use your mind to create capital. So maybe maybe it takes time and work in the beginning to set up that machine, but uh, there's lots of those kinds of things you can do to make money without just giving your life away to a job. Boy, this is a reoccurring theme. Jill, did you grow up this way? Is it a is it a regional American thing? Because we're obviously both uh, he and I, Luke and I, are from Michigan, and man, he, it, it, well said, Luke. Because I grew up the same way. You know, it, you either worked for Ford or General Motors, or you really just aren't taking life seriously. And I I wonder if that's still the sentiment out there. Or Jill, did you grow up that way in Southern California? Well, you know what's funny? I think my dad broke the mold because my dad is from Grand Rapids, but. He left at the age of 18 and went to Southern California and never looked back. And he always said his goal was to find a job where he made a lot of money and worked very little hours. And of course, he settled on a career of a you know long time airline pilot and and at commercial and did what he set out to do. So that that's what I grew up, you know, seeing and knowing was possible you know, and all that. No, you didn't have to work for a factory or, you know, you didn't have to do that. So, and also being out in California, you know, there's a lot of different paths and very open to different things. So it's good. The message I'm trying to send in all of our material is work pretty hard up front, get the systems in place, and then reap the rewards for the rest of your life. So, yeah, I'm, you know, you uh, 10 to 15 hour days for the first couple of years probably aren't uncommon, but then you're set up. Right. So, man, I agree. Yep. Love it. Having a job is almost counterproductive. Yeah. When you really, really look at the whole picture. Yep. It's enslavement. <laughs> In a word, that's what it is. Like mm-hmm. uh, as a guest, you can say words like enslavement, but as a host, you can't say stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Last question. When uh, will you know you're done with your career? Do you have like a an exit strategy that you're following? Do you have a, a financial goal or a circumstance? I, I'm kind of already done. I mean, I'm set for for every, you know, everything that I want. Now it's about my kids. And so this is all for my kids. These are deals that are going in my kids' accounts. And uh, 
I've set up a couple of companies for my kids that are like investment companies to keep track of them and pay their, you know, pay for their, their milestones in life, like education and maybe their, their first couple of businesses they set up and fail and lose my money on. Right. <laughs> instead of, <laughs> instead of going into debt like I did. I mean, they have to fail at something because they won't appreciate it otherwise. Oh, yeah. If I pay for them to start the business, they'll definitely lose the money. <laughs> That's the way it is. That's exactly. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so hopefully I can finance their learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> hey, finally, do you have any uh, burning questions for us? Um, I'm drawing a blank. I mean... It, I think you said two weeks. You put two weeks on your offers. You know when people get the offers to call you back is a call to call to action. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that with like testing different numbers over time, or uh, that was my way of saying, hey, um, you can have the cash now or not. I mean, it doesn't. No one takes it seriously. We get calls. Yeah, you know, Jill, what what are you doing? Deals from two thousand and eight, two thousand and seven, right now. Exactly. They still come so, back. I don't think that I, I've never heard. Well, actually, a couple times I have heard, had call people call like a week later and say, "Can we really still do this? I want to do it." So, um, the, the two week piece isn't over one week or three weeks. It was pretty. Uh, I guess it was an arbitrary choice on my point oh, a lot of years ago. But um, I think giving them. A, I think the whole point to that is give them a time period to work with them. Mm-hmm. Don't just say it's an open ended thing. The other thing too is that. A time frame like that makes that offer void after that, yeah. after it's expired, which uh, from a legal standpoint is an attractive thing, I think. It's easier to come back with a different number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. About, yeah, it was a thousand bucks last week. Now it's now it's 500. How about the terms deals? Someone moves on to the property, I mean, and stops paying. Do you ever have to get into like evictions or foreclosure or anything? I mean, it's always been easy to work with them or? Mm-hmm. Uh, I've never experienced anyone who th- the vast majority, if not everyone, just disappears. Yeah. They, you know, they don't it, it's not they don't fight us on it or ask for their money back or any for whatever reason. They just kind of fade away. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jill, have you experienced any you, you talk to the, talk to the. Uh, the buyers all the time. No, I was knocking on something at that moment too. Cause, <laughs> no, I haven't. I, but I, the, I no, it doesn't happen. I really, and I have one guy right now actually that he's had just this year for some reason he's got some money issues going on, so he gets behind, but then, then he catches up, and then he gets behind, and then he catches up. So, and it's a couple hundred dollars a month, and and I'm I'm his. He's just so happy that I'm willing to work with him that everything's great. Yeah. Do you do you ever charge him the fees that we're supposed to charge? I hope not. No, good. I don't. Good for you. I I don't. It's all good. So you know, and if anything crazy happened, and we've accidentally bought properties before, not I mean, you know, that had structures on it that we didn't plan on being there. It's kind of like, oh, hey, it's a bonus. All right, fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's great. So if someone walked away and left me a shed that they were working on, then oh, okay, great. I'll take that. <laughs> I mean, the truth is uh, the, the margins on these properties are so high. I mean, if, if one person, I should, I, hopefully there's not a lot of our customers are, are not, don't listen to this show. <laughs> if somebody said uh, five years into a 10 year contract, hey, I live here, I don't have any more money. I would just say, that's thanks very much. You know, let's let's just call all call it even, and uh, let's rip up our contracts. Joe, wouldn't you do something like that? Absolutely. I just we make our money back in probably what on a lot of these deals in the first two or three months on a and their payment streams of mm-hmm. what ten years sometimes ten or fifteen years on the larger forty acre property. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's Super it's real flexible. easy to be generous in this business. It is, and and it is, and I love it. Yeah, so. Well, it's great. Yeah. Good. Anything else, Luke? I, that's it for now. It was great to have you on the show, man. I, I yeah, really... Thanks for, uh, thanks for setting this up. Yeah. Oh, no no problem at all. If you have any questions, um, check us out on successplant.com. It's all set up for, uh, for our members to ask questions through that venue. And uh, I hope to see your name on our 4 o'clock call today, conference call with everybody. Unless you're at the beach. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's raining today. I the, saw that. It's all cloudy here too. Coming yeah. our way. So. One of the 14 rainy days a year. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> Send some our way, man. Yay. <laughs> He's going to do just fine. Oh, I have something funny to say about Luke. He doesn't know this yet. But when he said, you know, I'm kind of already done. I'm kind of already retired. I, want, I, I have a little note here because he was reaching out to me. What started this, he reached out to me the day asking for um, picking up a handful of properties to kind of get his feet wet a little bit and just wanted to buy like a bundle. I'm like, okay, sure. So I'm, you know, that this is, it's the good thing. Never assume what someone can afford or not afford. So the properties I'm going to bundle up. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to price gouge. I can't no, no, even remember. No. remember. I was just thinking, all right, maybe, well, I'm trying to think, well, is the guy's budget 1000 2000 3000 Oh, yeah, no, Luke's going to get a really nice offer of some really good properties now that I know what he can afford. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that is why we're business partners, Jill. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm sure Luke will listen to that and laugh. That'll be really good. <laughs> you know, he said the same thing about um, sending his initial mailer out that uh, – one of our other members talked about last week was, you know, they had overwhelmingly positive return on the initial mailer that they sent. So they bought the package. Mm -hmm. That's, <laughs> That's it. great. It's what it's supposed to do. I love it. It's like, well, like, you know what it is here. Oh, I was just reading about this based on our conversion fanatics guy that we um, interviewed the other day, which I love that guy. Um, one of the things that Justin does, because they do stuff with all kinds of different businesses, but they set up test markets and they do test things. And I'm like, and, and that, well, they tell, and, and I'm sorry, that wasn't the point. They, they, um, for upping your numbers, a good way to up your numbers, say I sell, you know, whatever product, if you could have a test period of it or free trial period of it, that usually leads to, uh, conversion. Sure. So what's funny is for us, I never set out to do that, but yeah. the version of that is our ebook. If you get our ebook, which is free, then you go out there and you, oh, I'm on a free trial period. Try these concepts. Mm -hmm. People like Luke just did. Then, oh, by the way, it works. Okay, trial period's over. Now I know it works. Right. Uh, we're, uh, I'm in. You know, I, I, I'm in. So mm -hmm. It's we kind of accidentally did our own version of that. Yeah, we did. So it's perfect. So cool. Yeah, he's going to be fine. He's got the the right attitude, and uh, you know, I think um, he's going to get out that mechanical process driven, um, you know, a process driven mind toward uh, 100, 100 mailers a day, one hundred twenty mailers a day kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I appreciate too about our members uh, is they all have the right. At I have yet to meet a member that does not have the right attitude who's scrambling to do this for a reason. Yeah, they, me too. You're right. They've all really thought about this and they're really, you know, prepared and planned and they're taking a step back and doing this the right way. They're not quitting their jobs. They're not, you know, buying vacation properties, you know, on the side or whatever, buying that Ferrari and they're really doing this the right way. And it's, right. yay, that's, that's what you should be doing. So all that stuff will come. Of all the things I worry about on in life, I'm not worried about Luke. Nope. You too can have an almost vintage Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> How's if your you car? Do it right. Oh, well, I, let's see. There's a couple lights on, but other than that, it's normal <laughs> because it is an old. So, is it in, are the lights in German? No, the lights aren't in German. <laughs> it's funny you say that. So, yeah, that's good. Everybody who drives my cargo gets confused because the key goes on the left, not the right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a little hard to get to have to think about it when they start the car. It's good. Woo. All right, Jill, let's go buy some property. We are Jack and Jill, and this was the Cash Flow from Land Show. We are the experts at acquiring property of all kinds, not just land. For half price, just so we can flip it for way more. And really fast. Thanks for listening. You are not alone in your real estate ambition.